Art Deco furniture is going to be luxurious. It's going to look incredibly expensive, but sometimes looks can be deceiving. What you'll see frequently is going to be the use of wood veneers, almost always a high polish finish. We'll see a lot of Japanese black lacquer finishes on these pieces. Oftentimes they will come down to a fine point on the foot. Uh, that's going to be very, very common. A chrome foot or bright metal foot is going to be very common. Bright metal, of course, referring to polished metal. They tend to be very rectilinear. Now, despite the fact that they tend to have these characteristics, of course, you know that we have new technologies that we talked about. The use of plastics, for example, the use of cheaper manufactured goods. And so we're going to see that as well. We really see that split in this period. So some of the typical pieces that we're going to see, we're going to see skyscraper furniture playing off of that new technology of the giant skyscraper like the Empire State Building or the Chrysler Building. And skyscraper furniture literally mimics the lines of a skyscraper, in this case, a bookshelf. And it's a really unique piece. It's a fantastic piece for a small space. It uses verticality to make up for its lack of horizontal dimension. That means that it's a really efficient piece in terms of the use of floor space. Why have a six foot tall wider bookshelf when I can have an eight foot tall bookshelf that's going to be much narrower. It also mimics that step like form of many of the skyscrapers really mimicking the Empire State Building in this case. We will see a lot of female forms frequently nude or semi nude female forms and they're often holding lights and other things, although we will see them in other forms. Now, the bronzes and these polished metal pieces like you see here can actually be very, very expensive on the market today, especially if they have the original shade with them. And some of these, they may be holding a globe. They may be holding some other form. We will see them used for example, in architectural detail or in details on furniture, although they avoid a lot of relief ornamentation on furniture in Art Deco because, of course, that's difficult to manufacture. We will see something called Vere Eglosmis, and I'm probably horribly mispronouncing that. This is basically gilding the back side of glass after having done reverse painting. So you're going to reverse paint the surface. So I'm painting on the back side of the glass and then I'm going to go ahead and gild the back of it uh, right over that reverse painting, usually with silver and gold. So you see that being done here, uh, the use of the leafing. It's a very interesting technique and it speaks directly to Art Deco, although you see something similar popping up in the 1970s in cheaper home decor items. We will see a lot of overstuffed chairs. The upholstery is getting larger and larger as we move forward in time. Of course, originally it would have been fairly expensive when we started looking at it going back to the Renaissance. But as we move forward, of course, the fabrics are becoming less expensive. They are increasingly synthetic fabrics, which means they last a little bit longer, the fabric itself. And the style, people just want to be comfortable. Remember all the austerity going on through this period between the Great Depression and things going on in Europe. So they're going to want that luxurious feel of an overstuffed chair or an overstuffed couch. We're going to see certain designers creating what you would consider fairly typical Art Deco pieces. For example, this Elaine Gray dragon chair where she has taken the arms and carved them into these stylized dragons. Now, if this were Art Nouveau, of course, those dragons would be fairly realistic. You would see some whiplash line in there. Here, they've been stylized, which means they've been simplified and fit to the form. She also does the same thing with snakes. You'll notice the chair is, again, a heavy overstuffed chair. It's just adding that level of decadence in the form of these artistic wooden arms. She will also create a very typically 
Art Deco table. This is meant as an end table. And it's that tubular chrome design that we would see as typically Bauhaus, and we'll get to in a little bit, along with a glass top. It's got that minimalist feel that is so common to this period and yet has a certain luxury to it because, of course, glass tops, while very, very common today, were not common at the time. The glass would have been far more likely to fracture and break in that period. And the use of bright chrome, of course, gives it that air of modernity and sort of a streamlined feel. In fact, when you look at it, if you were to look at it from the side, you would swear that it were something designed by someone like Frank Lloyd Wright coming out of the Prairie School or maybe an arts and crafts craftsman, except for the fact that it's using primarily steel tubing. Beds, of course, you're going to have a lot of sunburst and sunrise patterns, especially on headboards. The headboards tend to be larger. They're still playing off of the idea of the sleigh bed. So we have this outward turn primarily at the foot, although sometimes you'll see it at the head as well. And we have that typical Art Deco step pattern. Uh, that we've seen so often up until this point. Here they've used veneers to give it the impression of a very expensive surface, but of course we know that the wood underneath is probably a cheaper wood, maybe pine or maple, that's simply been veneered rather than actually making it out of burl, which is uh, what you're seeing here.